to She Wasn't Born Yesterday for women who are 40 plus fabulous by the Emptiness Chicks. I'm Janet Evans, ex MNC Saatchi advertising creative who have won numerous radio and TV awards. Not that that'll affect us because we're doing a podcast. And I'm Dr. Amelia Haynes, who has been a medical doctor for 30 years and specialising in sexual health and mental health and relationships, you know, and I'm generally a very useful human being. Well, you know, we'll find out about that, but <laughs> we are here to work together. People tell me on good authority uh, that I am. Really? <laughs> yes, well, they never say that to me, so I think we're the perfect hosts for She Wasn't Born Yesterday. Dr Amelia, she yeah. wasn't born yesterday and she is 40 plus fabulous. Yeah. Our guest today is a mum, grandma, teacher and daughter with ageing parents and she has negotiated the system and come out the other Who? side. Um, and I think there's a lesson in this for all of us. I think there are probably lots, lots of, of lessons. lessons. But yeah. one thing I do think is that you better be nice to your kids <laughs> now because they're going to be the ones that step up to the mark and have to look after you in your old age, in your yes. dotage, you know, yes. when perhaps you've lost a bit of capacity mm-hmm. and you're not as, you know, cool and hip and happening as you were. You, you've had the hip replacement happening. Yep. Yeah, be nice to them so that they do all the right things for you. But negotiating the system for aged care is something... It's a you, nightmare. I've heard well, it's a oh, nightmare. Right, really. Well, you see, the thing for me yeah. is that I haven't heard a lot about it. So I don't... I, I think, like, perhaps most people, you don't really think about it until you're there mm-hmm. and you need to suddenly access some services. And um, you kind of... I guess you don't have any idea how... whether it's going to be complicated or not. And therefore... I think it would come as a bit of a shock to the system to discover that perhaps it's more complicated, but you've heard otherwise. I have, and yeah. I was going to say, yeah. I think there's nothing better than being 40 plus yeah. um, to actually go, I'm going to start to um, become aware of what it's like. Uh, I'm sure it will change. Yes. Hopefully for the better, but who knows. Yes. Um, yes. But yes, no, yes. I think this is a fantastic um, topic and I yes. really want to hear from... Yes, from Margaret. From Margaret. Well, Margaret, tell us about your parents. How old are they and what's their health like? Okay, so unfortunately my dad passed away a couple of years ago at the age of 90. Uh, so not quite mm. through caring for the aged parents yet. My mum is still around. She's 87. Um, and I have to say the journey has indeed been what you said, more complicated and difficult than I anticipated. Yeah. Right, because what what's her health actually like? Like what, what sort of situation is she in? How old is she? She's 87. She's uh, got a number of health issues that affect her vision, her mobility, and her cognition. Um, So she does struggle. I think that that was also evident when my dad was was sick too because he developed vascular dementia in his later years and I think the combination was, was tricky. And so were they sort of looking after each other at home? Yes, they were looking after each other. They were in quite a remote part of New South Wales, which also created some anxiety for us. Uh-huh. Uh, so it was a good day's yeah. drive up to visit them if there was an emergency. Uh, so we couldn't really easily jump yeah. in and support them if they needed it. And in the later years that they were there, we often had to do that or go up there and take mum down to a local hospital. They were an hour's drive out of the nearest town and and then dad, because of his dementia, lost his driver's licence and, of course, he wasn't very forthcoming about this initially. Uh, And then we realised that um, (laughs) mum was the only driver and she was already visually impaired. It was really becoming very precarious. Tell me something, Margaret, it just instantly jumps into my head and I feel like people might actually have very similar issues with parents. Um, Why had people not said to your parents or your parents not said to you, in fact, actually, we're getting older. Should we put some things in place for us to be closer to you or closer to services, et cetera, et cetera? Well, some neighbours had actually uh, told me that they were concerned for them. Now, I was a bit embarrassed by this, but the reality was that they were very resistant to any change. So it was a matter of weighing up how to manage that 
against their particular needs. Yeah. As they were losing capacity, we were more aware of the issues as even were their neighbours, yeah. but they, again, they were not wanting assistance and really pushed back on it. And I get it because yeah. they're very independent, yeah. I understand that because, I mean, you don't want your independence to be taken away. No. You don't want to admit that you have some sort of mm. failings or weaknesses. And also perhaps these things happen quite slowly, so you're sort of not quite sure there's no kind of clear-cut time that you think, oh, today I'm okay at home, but tomorrow I definitely can't be. Yeah. So perhaps there's a gradual decline yes. as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure that this is exactly part of the problem is that that's what happens, gradual and also huge amounts of resistance. I mean, I know that I myself would mm. be very mm. resistant, mm. yeah. Mm. It's only a natural reaction, yes. They were managing on a day-to-day basis, but I was becoming more concerned about the number of trips they were taking into town and mum was driving an old van I'm not sure how much Dad was actually driving after he lost his driver's licence, but I know he had been. Uh, But he stopped, like he might switch drivers once they got a bit closer to town, for example. But they had to drive down a very precarious mountain pass to get to the nearest town or go the other way and go on a lot of dirt roads and also quite a busy road that wasn't particularly safe. So that was really of concern. And then as their medical issues became more complex and they had to do more trips to the town for that, they were going into town several times a week. And they even got to a point where Dad had Mm. an accident. He had to be in hospital for a while. Uh, And then Mum was driving in and out or staying out on the property on her own, uh, which was not a safe arrangement. Mm. They were off-grid, by the way. And there was a bit slightly dodgy phone connections. (laughs) That's right. So uh, as you can imagine how independent they were, more so than your average person because they were even, that you know, yeah. insisting on living off grid, that sort of thing. And, of- and no one helpfully said at the hospital when your father was <laughs> sick or injured, okay, like this is interesting, you know. How interesting is you should raise this, Amelia? Well, the thing is that um, my mum got very offended because someone tried to have a little chat to her about the D word i.e. dementia, and, of course, that wasn't happening in her mind, even though I was getting a different narrative from her about all the problems she was experiencing with Dad wandering off or doing stuff like that or being or having to watch him every moment she was at the shops, but he he didn't have dementia, um, apparently. Mm -hmm. So um, people tried to intervene, but they just didn't want to acknowledge. So do you remember a time when you actually had that conversation with them? Did you sit them down and say, hey, guys, look, we really need to do something now? Oh, yes. Or how did it actually happen that things changed? We tried yeah. multiple times, to be honest. Okay. And I remember one visit we went up there, my sister and I used to do a divide and conquer approach. And so she would hang with mum and I'd go down and hang with dad in a little house he was building. And I could have quite a good conversation with dad. Mm-hmm. And I said to him, we're going to have to make a decision pretty soon about what you want to do. Obviously, things are getting harder, and he admitted that. And I said, so what do you want to do? Do you want to move closer or do you want us to try and put in support so you can stay here? And he said, I think we need to move. Mum's eyesight is failing, but she hasn't told you that. And I said, okay, that's useful. <laughs> oh, great. I was getting that message from him, but also mum was saying, oh, no, we're fine, we're coping, and then she'd ring up and complain about all the things she was struggling with. So it was quite tricky. And so were you, you, you have siblings, were, were they aware at the same time you were and was everyone on the same page in terms of what you should do? So, yes, so the, I'll just explain the family dynamics. So <laughs> I have one sister who is particularly close to me and we can sit down and sort things out and have a good chat and get on the same page pretty quickly. My husband was also very helpful and has put up with an awful lot of my venting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Anyway, the other siblings are two others who were either not particularly involved or were, I would have to say, unhelpful. I won't go into the details. Mm, no. But that really made it difficult. Well, no, no. well but this is, this is good that you bring it up because mm. families are not straightforward. Mm. Your family was a bit patchy. Mm. Typical. Yeah, mm. and, family, and typical <laughs> in lots of ways, yeah. yeah. 
So at what point was the kind of crunch time that you said, you all said, actually, mum, you can't live here anymore after her husband passed away? Oh, no, dad passed away after he'd moved them. Oh. So at the end of 2018, it became quite apparent that it, they were really struggling. Mm. They'd been Mum was said that dad needed to see a neurologist and couldn't see one in that local country town. So I think that was the key for her that she finally switched because that was valid to go and find better medical care somewhere else. However, he was actually receiving mm-hmm. pretty good care from his GP. So I think it was just an excuse to or a save of face. Yeah. So we Mm. moved them in the end of 2018, but by then they'd got to such a point that they couldn't really move themselves. So we had to go up with cars and van and try and bring out the things that they wanted to move. Fortunately, uh, my sister and husband and I had already bought a little cottage quite near where we live, which we had planned to move them Mm. to. So they knew where they were going. They knew they'd be near us and near the rest of the extended family. So that worked well. However, the reality was that because their hand was forced, that made it much harder for them to adapt to the change. And then, of course, that just kept kicking on because they felt like the decision had been taken out of their hands. But we had been raising this for some years beforehand, and I'd often say, it'd be great if you could make the move while you can still do it. It'd be great if you could make a decision before we have to do something. Uh, But that just kept on being put off and put off until, unfortunately, we just had to jump on operation intervention of parent uh, to save parents. That's where it went. (laughs) So at that point, um, did you have sort of a power of attorney no. or something like that? Did you did you have to use any of that? We didn't have to go down a legal path until Dad became so incapacitated that he was admitted to hospital and then the very sensitive doctor said, well, do you want to take him home or send him to an aged care facility? And I thought, oh, that's a bit abrupt. I said, we can't take him home. Mum can't cope. Mm. He'll have to stay here in the hospital. Fortunately, it was a country hospital that could accommodate him for a while. And then we started looking around for an aged care facility nearby. So that all just happened really quickly. And that's often the case, I think, where you have a major crisis and then you've actually got to act. And again, that happens and it's harder to accept again if you haven't planned for it. That was really difficult. Um, And then because of the implications financially and legally, we couldn't act on dad's behalf. And because he had no power of attorney in place or enduring power of attorney documents, we had to go through NCAT. Now, I didn't know about NCAT until I had to approach NCAT. NCAT is a New South Wales uh, civil and administrative tribunal. And so that's actually means you've got to go through a legal process to apply oh, yes. for some sort of guardianship and financial management for the person who's incapacitated. That impl- involves collecting a whole lot of documentation, submitting it with the reasons why you need to have some management of the person's affairs. You also have to get their agreement. Uh, this all happened in the middle of COVID as well, which obviously complicated things. Oh, no. And then, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, so we eventually had a hearing at the local council chambers with the, the tribunal. They heard all the evidence. Dad was zoomed in from the care home and agreed that he did need some help and it went ahead from there. But uh, what if he hadn't agreed? Could it have gone ahead without him agreeing? I think the tribunal can make a judgment on whether the person's got capacity to make decisions for themselves or not. So in that case, I think they can make a decision. Mm. They can. I I think Mm. psychiatrists can get involved. Yeah. And how was your mother in all of that that was going on? Like how supportive of you and helpful to her husband and what was it like for her? She found it really, really big. It was big. She did not cope well. She wasn't used to being... Uh, having to make decisions like that. She just was really, really difficult. It, like it must have been awful. She shut, yes. yes, it was terrible. She basically shut down. She wouldn't speak to me. When I tried to even adjust some medical appointments for her because she'd got some doctor's appointments, so I said, look, do you want me to just ring up? I'll cancel the doctor's appointment, blah, blah, blah. And she finally agreed to even letting me. So even letting me do that, she was reluctant And then she had to listen in on the conversation to make sure I didn't say anything. So she was very concerned with how she was 
presenting or whether people thought less of her. She really struggled with dad not being there. Uh, She was involved though in a selection of the aged care facility at the time, which was good. So my Fortunately, I had my sister's son and my my daughter went with her looking at the local care facilities and they helped her choose one that they all agreed on. And then fortunately, my nephew, who's a paramedic, was able to fill in all the forms for her when he was admitted because she wouldn't have been capable of answering those questions. So we basically provided support that way. And I think too, I became more aware of how many cracks there were in our relationship, to be honest. And that made it even harder. It sounds massive, but I'm sort of thinking there must be so many people Mm. in a very, very similar position to um, Margaret's, Mm. which is overwhelming, actually, to think that so many people are in this position. Mm. Well, um, it's hard to know, I guess, until you're actually going through it, how everyone's going to react and what you need to put in place and what you don't and all of that sort of thing. And in terms of financial assistance, did you need to apply? for any of that? And how did that go, applying? First of all, yes, I'd agree. The more I've chatted to people, the more I've realised how common these very difficult situations are. So that Mm. uh, that was a surprise for me because I thought, oh, this is different, but it's actually not. Financial arrangements. Okay, so when we moved closer to us, I took them along to Centrelink. They were getting the pension to review their Centrelink payments. That part of the process wasn't too bad. Uh, We managed to get them on full pension. And then when Dad moved into care, Centrelink was able to provide. So they basically got single income pensions because Dad had to move to a different location. So that was really good. But then in terms of managing the rest of the finances, We had to go through the tribunal before one of us could be appointed as financial managers for dad. And so that delayed things like the sale of their property. And then also we had to set up when you go into a cage care, you have to provide a lump sum payment or ongoing payments to support the care of the person. And that's also means tested. So getting access to to their financial details was also tricky because they were used to being very private about that and didn't really want to share that information. But you know, we got there in the end. But I think when mum realised how critical it was, I think they are a bit more able to do that. But Centrelink needs to know everything, as do uh, the aged care facilities. They want to know how many assets, what assets you've got. Um, and they have to, they wow. add all that up and then they work out what you're going to pay on a day-to-day basis for the care. Oh, so, okay. So the aged care facility scales up or down the payment that you make according to your circumstances? Yes, that's quite a complex formula. And you can get information on that on the My Aged Care website, which is, I think it's that website where you can put in your... I bet that's really easy to navigate as well. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it's actually not too bad for... It's not too bad for a ballpark yeah, figure, actually. Right. Uh, their little calculator. And I noticed the lady at Centrelink was using that. Yeah, so it's actually quite good. Mm. Can I just ask one random lateral question just now, just in case I forget to ask it later? Mm -hmm. Um, Are you already planning your kind of age care kind of like plan? Like, (laughs) like have you gone, I am not going to let this happen to my children? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Amelia, uh, absolutely. Mm. Uh, All through this, I was just saying to myself, when you are 86, be reasonable. When you are 86, be prepared. Mm. Make sure you've got this stuff in place. And so my husband and I, we have got our wills sorted. We have done our power of attorney and enduring guardianship documents. Well, it took a critical incident to get that to happen, but we've done it. Um, Mm -hmm. And so we've also talked to our children. Uh, We've thought about how we're going to pass on our property, that sort of stuff. Yeah, Um, that's great. Yeah, yeah, which means, of course, the... You have more control, actually. You have more kind of Mm. say Mm. and can kind of talk to the children in general how you might be feeling or feel about that kind of thing. And, Mm. like, it means that you, yes, will be less kind of blindsided. Oh, yes, absolutely. So what were some of the big hoops that you had to jump through to uh, to just get everybody in a comfortable place and where they wanted to be and where you thought they should be? Well, there were lots of big hoops, Janet. So <laughs> NCAT was a big one yeah. and I, that was not something I even knew about. But fortunately, um, mum and dad had a lovely solicitor in their hometown who I had been to school with. And so we had a nice rapport. He was very helpful, very kind. 
So he told me about NCAD and the enduring power of attorney and guardianship and so on. He told me how I could access that. And so there's a website that you can access to get that information, Mm -hmm. which is actually very helpful. So that was a big one. I was a bit surprised that we had to, that that was so involved. But on reflection, I think it's actually really good because it's good to have checks and balances because we do want to protect the rights of our yes, elderly absolutely. people. Yeah. And I know that's a big issue. So going through that tribunal was actually good to see that they were checking, they were looking at us, they were assessing us, they were looking at the documentation and they were making a reasonable decision. So that was actually quite reassuring. Yeah. Dealing with Centrelink had its ups and downs. Mm. I think I'm not the first person to have said that one could find that a little challenging personally. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> No, you are not the first. <laughs> and I know I'm not the first to say no. that. Was it just the complexity of dealing with Centrelink? It wasn't, unfortunately, Janet. No. I actually did find that some of the people the first the people on the front desk mm-hmm. or the people dealing with you could be really quite unpleasant. Oh, okay. And others could be absolutely fabulous. Mm-hmm. Okay. Their phone consultations too, I, I found sometimes they were a bit aggressive towards me or another times so they weren't. Like it just depended on who it was. Uh, the other little frustration I had when we were trying to sort out all the financial issues was that I couldn't guarantee that I could see the same person if I went back for a subsequent interview. That was also somewhat frustrating that I didn't feel there was a lot of continuity of care in that organisation. And I know there's a lot of people in there who are doing their best for everybody. And I know they also do get abuse, but I went in with an attitude of just wanting to comply and to be helpful and I didn't always get a positive Mm. reaction back. That was tricky. What would you say were the really helpful things? It sounds like the um, solicitor that you knew personally, Mm -hmm. he was a really helpful factor. Yep. But um, who else would you go, thank heavens for bloody blah, that, you know, whoever it was, that really helped? Okay, so when Dad was hospitalised, there was a a social work unit and they were very helpful in getting his assessment done for his aged care. That's an ACAT assessment, aged care assessment. They came to the hospital, interviewed all of us and whoever in the family wanted to be present was there. They worked through that systematically to get him uh, assessed so that he would be eligible for the residential care. They were great. Uh, They also checked in to see how we were going, which was also really nice. So that was really good. I don't know what it's like in different hospitals, but that one was, was they were helpful, as, as helpful as they could be. I have to say that before we got to a really crisis point, I had gone to a seminar run by Anglicare mm-hmm. on caring for your aged parents. And I tried to see if, that's st- if they're still mm-hmm. offering that just mm-hmm. last night and I couldn't find it. Okay. But they've got a lot of really useful information on their website. But that little seminar, which was run near my local church, and it was a combined church event. I went along to that and they were very, very helpful talking through all the things that you would need to negotiate aged care rights, the rights of the aged person, which I hadn't really encountered before, and also the the different ways you can access care. So I found them really helpful. Yeah. And then when we did get some home care for mum, I found that mostly the people there, the Anglicare provider, and I'm sure the others are also just as helpful, were very helpful in working through what we could do. Yeah. So what sort of time frame are we talking about from the time you got the NCAT assessment through to sorting everything out with Centrelink? Are we talking weeks? Are we talking hours? So when we, so from when we first realised we needed to move mum and dad, that was mm. end of 2018. We okay. moved them in early 2019. We did our best to get them settled as as we could. Mm. After that, we started visiting places like Centrelink to sort out their pension and we managed to increase that, which was good. Yep. And then we were really trying to lock them in with some, some good health care to sort of get dad's. Dad had lost the ability to speak. He had aphasia. Yeah. That was one of the symptoms of his dementia and that was really difficult. Mm. And we got him to a local speechy, you know, there, so there were a number of things. Some of those things went well and some not so well, but he was really in decline Mm -hmm. and he was there for less than a year before we had the crisis of having to take him to hospital and then to the care facility. So once he got to that point, we then had to chase around and find somewhere 
and then we were trying to sell their property. So that's when we had to get NCAT involved mm-hmm. um, and get the tribunal order. That didn't happen till I think it was about the January the following year, 2020. So we were just in the process of trying to sort all of that out. After that, we talked to mum about getting a power of attorney and during guardianship in place and a will. That took a really long time because she was also losing capacity, I think, but also, again, I think unwilling to face the fact that she might be incapacitated. Mm. To be honest, I shelved it because I thought, oh, we are just never going to get this in place. Then one day I got a text or a call from Richard to say, you know, I need to get this off my desk what do you want to do? Mm. So I thought, okay, so I'll try again. I eventually, we managed to sign the documents finally in lockdown on a Zoom meeting because there were special provisions put in place during COVID to do that. Even then she nearly pulled out at the last minute. <laughs> I, pulled, I didn't know what to do. I thought I've done, worked so hard to get yeah. to this point. Then I said, okay, if you're not going to do it, you need to call him and let mm. him know. Otherwise, I've got the Zoom meeting all lined up. I've got all the documentation. It's your call, Mum. What do you want to do? Because I'm not going to pull it. So at that point, she had to call the solicitor, yeah? Well, she didn't because that would have been loss of face. (laughs) So Uh that's how Uh I got there. So then we did the Zoom call. Wow. I was going to say, <laughs> I know. So that was clever of you, oh, Margaret. Yeah. To say, psychology. Yeah. <laughs> it was a bit of a game. It sounds like you were doing a lot of this on your own. Uh, it, w- w- what about your siblings? And, yeah. Or were they just agreeing with everything you said? Or So as regarding my younger sister who we work to get the one I work with, she was great. So she was probably doing more of the ongoing day-to-day support of mum. And I was in the background trying to sort yeah. out all the legal financial stuff. That was what yeah. the role I took on, just to get it done. Yeah, so that's mm. how we did it. Sounds like it was pretty full time kind of job yeah, for you both. I was for thinking a, that for too. a few years. Like, there. oh yes. Mm-hmm. Did you were you also working, and did you also have a full time job? I didn't have a full time job at that point, which was a good thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My sister did, yeah. and my husband did, uh, but yeah. I didn't. So I could actually pull it out of the bag. Unfortunately, I had to cancel some stuff, which was disappointing but you know like other family stuff often a crisis would happen in the middle of trying to organize a bigger family event or seeing my kids or grandchildren and I'd have to pull the plug on that that happened quite a bit but they just well they the parents were more needy so I had to pull the plug and make those decisions which was not easy and I felt the loss of that not being able to Mm. catch up with my own children and grandchildren and emotionally how has the whole thing affected you? Because obviously these are practical and physical things that you're putting in place, but then there must be, you know, a lot of worry and angst behind the scenes that you're going through. Is that right? Or You've got it. Yes. Very, very stressful, very confronting at times. I think it's really hard to see your parents deteriorate before your eyes and then feel like you can't do much about it. So I'm, I, so I tend to try and jump in and fix things, but there's a lot I couldn't fix, but I was trying, I think I was trying to get things in place for them and that's how I was coping with it. Being a bit angry with you too, yeah. like just seems so incredibly sad when you're really trying to be helpful, but actually no, you, it's being received as you being interfering and controlling. Yeah. And Thanks, stuff. Amelia. Yeah. Could you be my counsellor? <laughs> That's a job. Yes, I could. Yes, I could. Just make an appointment. (laughs) That's exactly right. Uh, It is really hurtful because you're wanting the best for them and yet they're treating every decision you make with intense suspicion. Really tricky. Where are you at with your mum now? Where, Where is she at now and what are her needs at the moment? As I said before, I think the whole situation probably exposed some cracks in the relationship. I wish I could say that it was all warm and fuzzy, but it's not. And I think it's deteriorated further. So she's since gone to move with another sister and she's happy enough, I think. Obviously, obviously you're evil. (laughs) Yes, yes. Yes. That's it. (laughs) I am the evil one. Yeah, sadly, that is the case. So that's been the cost (laughs) for me personally, is um, pretty much a complete breakdown in the relationship. Um, does it make you like um, your husband's parents actually? Are they under control? Like what's happening over there on that side on of that things? side of the family? They were very, very different. In fact, you couldn't get a greater contrast. Oh. Now, and I was wow. just reflecting on this. They, I think, 
They were amazing people and I think a lot of it had to do with their deep Christian faith on reflection. Mm-hmm. Because So they passed away probably just over 10 years ago now. So it's about of a decade difference between dealing with Steve's right. family and then mine. Yeah. His father was a very lovely man who was mainly the primary carer for his wife because my mother-in-law had advanced Parkinson's. Uh, she'd had it for a mm. very long time and had managed it really well. Very determined, intelligent mm. woman. And he had cared for her a lot. When he passed away, we were a little bit surprised, but I think he had a, uh, he just went quicker than we expected. He passed away, then mm. she managed on her own fairly well. She rallied pretty well. But her Parkinson's was getting the better of her and we were quite concerned. Yeah. And then eventually she got to the point where she realised that she was not really happy being at home. So she requested that she move to a local nursing home, which she had selected, and that's what okay. she wanted to happen. Well, she then wait. gave my mm, husband power of attorney over her affairs and said, I want yes. you to, like, can you deal with all the bills? Because she was stressing about that. So Steve just dealt yes. with all of that. Mm. And then, <laughs> then she thought, oh, uh, she was not getting to church. So she asked her Bible study group to come and meet in her room at the aged care facility. Mm. And awesome. right to the end, both of them were more concerned about the people they were leaving behind than yeah. themselves. Right to the end. <gasps> Absolutely this extraordinary. This is so, Absolutely so extraordinary. Beautiful. In fact, on her deathbed, she said, don't forget to prune the apple trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's you couldn't amazing. get a more different yeah. Um, yeah. approach, yeah, to be honest. Wow. But yeah. I think that's testimony to how profound it is to have a genuine faith in Jesus. If you mm-hmm. know that this is not all there is and, yes, yep. I'm losing mm-hmm. what I've got here, it actually yes. means that hope helps you deal with what's in the now. It helps you yeah. accept your yes. frailty, your suffering and your ultimate passing because there's something beyond. Yes. And we could rejoice. We were sad, yes. but we could rejoice at the same time. Sounds very similar to your experience, mm. you know. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, I think your tale is a really helpful one, actually. Mm. And, you know, I think your story about both sides of mm, your family yeah. are really, really mm. helpful and super helpful for people thinking about how they're going to live their own mm. lives. Yeah. But I think for, you know, people who are 40 plus mm. fabulous, you know your parents are, you mm. are obviously mm. older. What would be your advice for people, you know, who are 40 plus, whose parents are ageing? Is it that you would suggest that, you know, you, you would sit down and have a little family meeting if possible and talk about the future? Or what, what sort of advice could you give people listening? The best thing, as you said, start the conversations early before there's a serious need mm. and hopefully there'll be good conversations. Mm. But don't be surprised if there's pushback. Yeah, I was going to say, that's not guaranteed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's going to be difficult. And, and, of course, they won't want to leave their home and, of course, they won't want a carer coming no. in or um, start the conversations. At least you get I'd a, like a carer coming in. Yeah, sometimes I think that would be pretty <laughs> handy, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> get as much information as you can. Um, in terms of the legal stuff, the, the NCAT website is actually very helpful. Uh, which explains all of those legal things really well, those little videos they've got. Have a good support network. Like make sure you invest time with your friends, your church, people, your family that are on side with you uh, so that you've actually got people you can talk to. I mean, I couldn't have coped without the ability to vent to my husband repeatedly. I said, you don't need to fix this. I know you can't fix it. Just listen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And he's, beautiful, he's learned that, beautiful. which is really good, and have a good solicitor. Mm-hmm. So if I could clone Richard, I would. Um, someone who understands your family, who, they, who your parents will trust, that's really valuable. And someone who'll just actually advocate for you. So that was great. And I could be very honest with him about the situation and he understood and didn't judge, just, okay, noted and... Uh, and chat to other friends. And yeah, as yeah. I said, Jen, Jen, um, you said, yeah, I don't think it's that unusual to have a difficult journey. And I'm learning that more and more as I do talk to people. That's very true. So we shouldn't be afraid of actually mm. having those conversations with our friends that we trust and say, look, I'm struggling with this. Just can I let us talk to you about it? Or maybe they'll share something with you. I have to say, my, if you're in a church community, having other people that you can, you don't have to tell them everything, but asking them to pray for you, that is really helpful. Mm. 
Just to know you're not alone. To know you're not yeah. alone. And did you do anything particular to uh, decompress, like after a really emotionally stressful day? What, apart from break out in hives? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she broke out in hives and spoke to her husband. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's easy to forget to look after yourself, but yeah. you have to. So, mm. yeah, so I, I enjoy seeing my kids and grandkids going for a walk, especially in the in the bush. I was going to say, and making sure that you've passed on the kind of power of attorney to, mm. you know, one of your children who you love. Totally. Exactly. Mm. What a beautiful, beautiful thing to bonus. do. What a I know, what a, a beautiful proactive thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have totally done that and we've checked in with them and said, How do, these are, this is why I've chosen you two, is that okay yeah. with you? And told the other ones why we chose them and said it's not, it's not about favouritism, it's about the fact that it's just practical and we know you'll all talk to each other and we don't have to worry yeah. about that. So as things progress with your mum, are you going to have to step in and take a role there or has that been taken away from you? Where's that situation at the at moment? At the moment, my sister is providing care for her and I guess at times I'm a little bit anxious about that because she's also got some serious health problems. And I know it sooner or later we'll probably have a crisis. Yeah. So that's probably when we may have to step in again. But at the moment, mum's pretty reluctant to give up her, yeah, she's wanting to manage things herself and with my other sister. So that's where it's at at the moment. It is a little nerve-wracking at times. You're kind of like a um, a tiger ready to just spring into action, but you're just kind of just walking through the jungle yeah. at this you, point. You're a bit tied yeah, up at the moment. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, love, I love that. That's very <laughs> poetic. Thank you. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's ready to pounce when necessary, yeah. but I'll, I may get clawed in the process. But uh, <laughs> yeah. right. No, you won't. No, you won't. Well, uh, they'll try, but you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah. I, yeah, I can imagine that is just absolutely the hardest thing, like that mm. where your parent is just uh, in a completely opposite frame of mind to you. So you can see something clearly for them and you mm. think, look, I know that would be best, but they 100% disagree and therefore you're absolutely at this stalemate where you can't do anything if they are in their right mind. I imagine a lot of people are in that situation. I expect so. And it's a crisis that brings things out as we've discovered, and then you've got to act and then you've got to wear the consequences of that. Well, we all yeah. do. There's one no way or the perfect other. perfect solution. No. There is yeah, a It sounds like no. you're really just reacting to things as they occur and you've just got to, it sounds like, my take out of all of this is you've just got to understand what's out there, what's around, like in terms yeah. of services and and understand what they are and how to access them. And, and actually kind of start to get your head around them. Yeah. Before... There's yeah, a crisis. Before you need them. Exactly. Like, yeah. mm. yes. Especially Look. get to know someone at Centrelink and take them out for coffee <laughs> and drinks and, and, and make them be really nice to you and have just that person. Unfortunately, I think yeah. Margaret let us know that you probably won't get the same person to Yeah, but yes, yes, that's exactly yes. right. Yes. Yeah, exactly Sometimes right. you were surprised, so we did. Yeah. So the regional yeah. areas, the regional centres, you're probably more likely to get the same person twice. Um, and that may yes, or may not yes. be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, there is that. There is or the that. other solution is just don't get old. Yes. Well, this is what I've decided. You either die young or get old. So <laughs> yes, yes. Your option? they're your options, basically, yes. Janet. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> well, Margaret, we have loved having you on the podcast today because I think we've all learned a lot about what it's like to navigate the aged care system and some of the many challenges in place. And um, it's just great to hear your story and your perspective and, and share your wisdom on it. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah. yeah. This has been fantastic. My pleasure. Lovely to chat, ladies. Thank you. Gorge, we hope you enjoyed this episode, but we'd love to get to know you better and share more about our lives, what we get up to, what you get up to, and some insider goss and cheeky sneak peeks. So why not join our Facebook group? It's called She Wasn't Born Yesterday for lots of little extras. Your chance to comment, make suggestions, tell us if there's a topic you'd like us to talk about. Or just to say day. Either way, join us next week on She Wasn't Born Yesterday. We look forward to your company. 